Hey, superstars, welcome back to another episode of Word Up with Danny Katz. Today I am joined by an earth healer, land steward, grid worker, and wise woman badass, Jane Sully Cole. I had Jane come onto the show to talk to us about grid work, about working with nature spirits, about that whole realm of conversation um, that at least for me has been pretty mysterious, pretty woo-woo, seemed pretty out there. And after working with Jane and doing some of her workshops, it started to get more grounded, it started to get more accessible. And um, my prayer is that it does the same for you, the listener, um, and help support you in engaging a more collaborative, co-creative, generative relationship with nature. Heads up, we had some tech dif difficulties. Um, Mercury is retrograde at the time of this recording, and there were a few moments where Jane's um, audio didn't entirely match up with the video. So I'm giving you a, a heads up because if that's something that you find annoying, I'm going to recommend sticking with the listening versus the watching, despite how beautiful Jane is. Um, she did drop off once, we worked it out quickly. So thank you for your patience and tolerance with the slight tech glitches. I don't think it's going to interfere with um, the potency of our conversation. I am reminding you to click the subscribe button um, and also to click the notification bell next to the subscribe button so that you will be emailed when my every next video comes out. I just heard from my own brother two days ago that he was unsubscribed from my channel. Thank you, Google Thought Police. So um, the best way to ensure that that doesn't happen, I mean, I can't actually ensure that that doesn't happen. And um, hopefully clicking the notification bell will help. And what will for sure help is to sign up for my newsletter at either dannycats.com or quantumlanguaging.com, where um, you will be apprised of um, my video drops, my workshops, my webinars, books, live events, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the Thought Police have not yet figured out how to censor the newsletters. So it's just a safeguard that ensures that you and I get to stay in touch. And in the meantime, do click that subscribe button, like, share, comment, all that stuff helps give me reach. Allegedly, I don't know if the rules are the same. Um, for such dangerous people as me. Um, also reminding you that my show is cut into two parts. So the first half is free on all of the audio podcast platforms, as well as on YouTube and on my locals page. The second half is reserved for my paying supporters on both locals and Patreon, where for as little as $5 a month, you get access to all of my second half conversations plus bonus content, special discounts on offerings, et cetera, et cetera. Links are below. Choose the platform of your choice or both because and rocks. Um, and I think that does it for housekeeping. Buckle up and prepare to enjoy my conversation with the lovely Jane Sully Cole. Well, thanks for being us with us today. I'm going to sidestep the envy I'm having for the hair day that you're having to focus on the task at hand. How did you become an earth healer? I know you came from like a pretty hoity-toity educational background and probably more. So can you walk us through the steps that got you into earth stewarding and earth healing? Absolutely. Um, and I'm actually low key writing a book about all of this so that I can sort of support other people who may be sort of coming through the process of exiting one dimension that they reside in and walking into something completely different. So I would say that I have been in communication with the spirit realm and specifically with plant and nature spirits most of my life. Um, I can sort of have memories of like laying in the yard and 
sort of communicating with the wind or the water in my shower was always like a really big support in a way that I couldn't really articulate. Um, but as you mentioned, I did come up through, um, you know, middle class Westchester outside of New York City, where none of this would have been socially acceptable. And so um, really the way that I came into it as an adult was I completely towered or demolished my life as I knew it. I was, uh, my husband and I were, were in, we were owning, we owned a restaurant in Vermont, a farm to table restaurant. And um, that started to go downhill. And I was having trouble, which is, which was sort of interesting with these two sort of spirits on the property that were actually causing people to quit uh, working for us because they were so intense. Um, and how, did so, you know, how did you know that it was spirits that were creating the disruption? Well, we noticed a, the biggest thing was we noticed a lot of emotional changes in our staff. So they would come um, in one attitude and then over time you could tell they were really affected by something outside of themselves. Um, I also had one of our staff members just straight told me uh, um, there's something here. It's disturbing me so much that I can't continue working for you. And when, um, when you and got that I, feedback, were you like, that's fucking crazy? Or were you like, yeah, I'm aware there's a spirit. <laughs> I was more, you know, that I was aware. Um, I, one of the things that I, I teach a lot about now in my grid working workshops and my earth healing workshops is the first step when you're ever experiencing any kind of spirit or any kind of um, energies from other realms is to look at the history of where you are. So it's really important to know who was there before you, what were their experiences, what was the place that you're in used for in antiquity, because that can kind of inform you of some framework as to what could be going on. Mm -hmm. um, and so I knew about the history of the building and I very clearly could match some of the symptoms that I was seeing our staff and even myself on occasion experiencing to those energies. And what so, was the history of the location where you had your restaurant that allowed you to make this connection? So um, it was in Vermont and it was owned by a middle-aged couple who before them, um, they had bought it from another couple who had tried to do a restaurant there and were there for maybe two couple decades before they had experienced financial ruin and divorced. Um, so we knew about that. And then of course, because of the, his, there was a historical component, which is why the current owners, in addition to buying it off their previous owners, bought it was because they wanted to preserve this historical building. And it had actually been built in the early 1800s, about 1812. And you could see in the attic of this building drawings that the original people who lived there did in the attic when they were wintering up there for warmth. So they actually drew an American flag on the wall and dated it um, like in the winter, winter of 1812. Ooh. So we knew that it had been there for a very long amount of time. And um again, through talking with the owners and, and once they were kind of going through a lot of the historical data, they realized that the original owner actually had two teenage people, I mean, I guess we'll call them slaves, but they were two teenagers that he had there with him. And this is Vermont, so this was very rare. Um, and they lived there in the house and were sort of the maid and cook of the building for the family. and. That was who I believe was haunting, who was creating this um, energy shifts in this building. These were two teenagers who were obviously a very different skin color and um, had different experiences than their overlords and their bosses, and they weren't getting paid. They knew that if they were to leave, they would immediately have been brought back there because everyone knew that they lived there. Um, and so there was a lot of sort of this trapped 
anger and sadness. Um, so the, the girl who was there would be affecting a lot of the women. You'd be overwhelmed by, by some kind of sadness that was unexplainable. And the male spirit was really targeting the men and specifically our first chef who um, experienced a huge shift in himself emotionally while he was working for us over that year. I mean, went from being very mild mannered to just screaming and shouting and um, acting really, really angry and almost sometimes violent towards us and towards his staff, which, you know, is, isn't too far of the, out of the realm for a chef necessarily, but um, watching him from when we hired him to later on um, in his employment there, it was just really marked difference. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, because I, I knew this was going on and I, I in tune from again, like bridging the history to now, um, I got the sense that whenever this restaurant was busy, it made these spirits feel, feel like they had to go to work. They were, you know, disturbed by, it was disturbing their peace to have this movement, the chatter, which is, I think, partly why the previous couple was never successful there and why we had just so many issues ourselves. And um, at that time, I was sort of at the beginning of going through a deep transformation and spiritual awakening. And so I actually, um, researched and, and found a woman in the area who could support us in removing these energies or at least helping them transition. Um, and, you know, we had, we had a lot more knowledge at that time than I did and about, you know, specifically transitioning spirits. And so we called her in, um, she did a walk through for about an hour and sat us down and said, you know, at first I didn't really think any, you know, I wasn't feeling anything. I wasn't sure about what was here, but then she said after she had been there for about 30 minutes, she felt like she was like, it was like instantly it hit me like super hard, this really heavy emotional presence. And she was so um, overwhelmed by it that it sort of changed her plan of action. And um, she was like, this is going to take a really, really deep clearing that could be days on end. No one can be here. Um, the current chef that we had then after our first chef left had two cats. She was like, the cats are going to need to have a cleansing as well. Anything that's here is going to have to experience this, this cleansing. And, and um, we didn't at the time have the permission from our, the building owners, which is a really vital part of clearing. Um, and so we just said, this is our time to leave and ended up leaving altogether because of that. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah. And then how did that, well, before I ask you how that took you into the work that you're doing now, when you were a kid and you were, you know, connecting with the wind and having this specific relationship, was your family supportive? Were they aware? Was this like a secret thing? It was very secret. My family was not aware at all. Um, they, they were, my dad, I would say sort of dabbled in what I would consider African mysticism in college, um, but neither one of them was aware were aware of what was happening. I didn't really want to share it because I was afraid of, you know, the response. And, um, you know, at that time, I think I just didn't have enough confidence in myself to really be authentic about it. It was sort of something that I wanted to hide. So, yeah. Not, not something that I really felt outwardly, you know, was outwardly available to me until much later. Yeah. So you were having, you were already having your own spiritual transformation. This thing happens with the restaurant and the property. And then how did you jump all the way to Earth Steward or Grid Worker? Um, well, I had started at the time just listening to podcasts and subscribing to newsletters from people that I were were claiming to do grid work. And so what grid work is, is it's at its core is it's a form of earth magic of geomancy in which, you know, anyone can support earth's ley lines and, and magnetic fields energetically. 
Um, and so I was following women that were practicing, especially like around the solstices or big gateways. They were practicing grid work where they were out in nature, um, supporting the balance and the integration of these really great energy waves that were coming in. This was in 2018. Um, and so I was getting inspired and learning a lot. And, um, you know, through the sort of um, destruction of the or implosion, I guess, of our business, um, my husband and I decided basically to pack up our entire car. We closed everything down. We closed our business and we drove down to New Mexico where he's from. And along that drive, I basically was going through a massive identity crisis. Um, I was like leaving an entire skin behind that I had known my entire life um, and a career path and trajectory that made sense to me and just basically walking straight into the unknown. And so from there, I sort of had to, with you know zero pieces, tangible pieces of myself to hold on to, I really started experimenting with what is important to me. Um, what does mean something to me? What am I naturally drawn to or intuitively drawn to? Um, and it just kept coming up that I was this, you know, this concept of grid work. Um, and then I started just to witness in myself that I was really drawn to um, commute. I, I could receive downloads and communications from trees. So that was the trees were like the first, I guess, um, plant spirit that really came online for me besides, you know, my experience of maybe some air elementals or water elementals when I was younger. But, um, and what it was for me was that I felt if I was physically at the, you know, physically with a tree, I would receive either emotional qualities or imprints like images of what the tree was experiencing. So mm -hmm. I was able to create this sort of framework for communication, but not in a way that's verbal in a, in a nonverbal way. And so um, from there, I stumbled upon the work of a Slovenian artist named Marko Pogacnik. And he has a book called Nature Spirits and Elementals, Communing with the Beings of Nature. And I read that and I just was, my mind was blown. I was like, this person gets me. Um, they know what I'm saying. They know, they know, they have these experiences. They know what's happening. There was a ton of foundational information that I received that sort of helped me build a little bit more on these experiences that I was having with myself. And um, I love to travel. I have traveled my entire life. And um, I never, looking back on it now, I think that part of what I was doing was physically receiving certain codes in my body from places I visited and then also imprinting my energetic frequency onto those places to support for support. Um, at the time, I just think thought of it as like when I was little, Oh, my head is tingly while I'm standing by these mega stones in France or, um, you know, feeling just a sense of like open hearted glee at seeing the Grand Canyon for the first time. Um, so that once I found Marco's work and I sort of had this more of a framework for what I was exp already experiencing, that's when I really began to um, just like really hone in on what I felt were these gifts that I had. So I would drive in the car to different places I felt called to. I would take myself on what I would call intuitive journeys where I just would get in the car with no destination. I did one across the country and back from California and just it net, literally didn't know where I was going to sleep that night. I would just feel every moment of what was happening and was called to some really incredible places. And since then it's just blossomed um, from, you know, again, like a, a, a complete deconstruction of self and you know regrowth in this really organic way so that's all right i have so many questions but um in reverse order it just sound it sounds like to take a cross-country trip guided by intuition feels like a type of vision quest i imagine that that was 
an incredibly empowering experience. Like how did that change you and change your relationship to reality? Well, you know, I mean, I do believe in this concept of zero point, which is, you know, wanting to be in, in complete co-creatorship with the universe. So if we're thinking about zero point, time necessarily isn't real. It's a construct of the earth plane, but it's not like a universal construct that's, you know, out in other dimensions, um, places we know it, um, you know, the planet that we do where we make lists and we um you know have a, a structure for what I'm doing tomorrow on what Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday you can really just let all of that go and it's terrifying because I am have spent my whole life wanting to be in a lot of control and you really have to surrender to this wisdom of your in yourself that you're just sort of learning how to calibrate so I was you know I would just feel to myself, okay, this is, I feel like I'm supposed to get off at this exit. I feel like, oh, there's a big lake here that I can go and spend time with. Or um, I was also drawn to, I spent some time in North Carolina at the Cherokee National Forest where uh, my great, great grandmother is Cherokee. So I spent some time in there. Um, And so it, it, it sort of actually brought out, I think, more of who I am because I I uh, I was able to completely play with these parts of myself that want to be a totally untethered, unstructured, um, and make it up as I went, and it it was incredibly uh, rewarding in that I, you know, I spent about three and a half weeks going back and forth, and um, was was led to some really incredible, really beautiful places that I never would have maybe you know stopped and and spent time that if I was, you know, because before this point, I was anytime I was making a cross country journey, it was with purpose. And this purpose was to just be 100% in the moment. I love that. And the way that you language it, because you did it with purpose. And then this trip helped you connect with your capital P purpose. It sounds like in terms of letting go of those smaller, like contrived purposes. Yes. Yep. And, you know, um, leading with, leading with a a completely different frame of mind, you know, I shouldn't even say of mind of, of spirit. I mean, there was no way to have my mind involved because my mind was panicking the whole time. Um, you know, where am I going to sleep tonight? Where is it okay? You know, not being able to plan or not having a plan for even later on where I was going to eat you know, that was really terrifying for my mind and my, you know, probably somewhat a little bit of like the inner child, you know, was a little bit like, this is, it felt a little scary, but it was an opportunity for me to also witness many parts of self and bring them into wholeness. Like we're all here together. It's going to work out. Um, and, and that I was very protected. I was safe. Um, I never really felt unsafe during any part of the trip. And um, that was a great also just confirmation that, you know, we do live in a benevolent world and, you know, really by, we we can drop in truly to our hearts and let that guide us. And it's not, we're not, we're not leading ourselves into danger. It's just the, these are experiences that our mind has had or, or is formulated is, what creates those fears. It's not really real. They're not really reality or at least as I experienced it. Yeah. As I hear you speaking, like, and this is a very common framework for me, but that you moved really into your feminine and allowed that feminine to guide you that trust, that unknown. And it's that masculine mind that's wanting to figure everything out and know where we're going to eat and sleep and all those things. So it sounds like you took this like giant leap into your capital F feminine. Absolutely. And, you know, that's a great point that you bring up there because I think I was operating in my masculine for a really long time. Um, And I was, you know, allowing this like structure, rigidity, to sort of guide me and um, the fluidity that I was able to experience 
leaning into these, you know, different um, stops along the way on, of my grid working trip were um, really supportive to like gaining trust and wholeness between the two. You know, it was like the feminine was like, I can lead us through the unknown. And the masculine is like, okay, and here's, I trust you. I'm trusting you a little bit more, a little bit more, you know, and, you know, really brought myself into a state of whole, in, inner wholeness, mm. inner union. I, I just got to chill when you said that, because I think so often in the masculine feminine conversation, we're like, well, let's bring back the feminine and like shit on the masculine. And it's like, no, let's alchemize both in a balanced, harmonious way, since they're both so important um, and work together so well. I'm curious. Absolutely. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, go ahead. Absolutely. Okay. I was just agreeing. Yeah. Um, so regarding grid work in general, like in the larger conversation about like climate crisis, the earth is dying. No, it's cycles. Like whatever anyone's perspective may be, I think one of the through lines is that the earth doesn't need us. And even if humans screw it up for ourselves, the earth will be fine. So how does that perspective tie in with grid work and having humans doing things in service to Gaia? Does she need us? I think that the key need us? I mean, I think the key there is, is yes, that I, I don't want to say she needs us. I think what really it is, is that she loves us. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the, the mother here, especially Mama Gaia, really loves every single creation that is here and without judgment. Um, and so, you know, my belief is that it's not so much, you know, of course we could say humans are have destructive tendencies and, and I think where that really comes from is disassociation and trauma. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really, I feel like a deeply embodied, healed, self-loving human is, is, is loving, you know, is wanting to create more joy and beauty. And I mean, I, you could say that really to like, even the most, you know, maybe sur on the surface, like harrowing people you know if they're they probably they're what their actions probably stem from some kind of trauma experience and you know again if they're if they're a loved being if they love themselves and if they're healing themselves I think really just naturally we we as humans want to co-create love and beauty and understanding and compassion um and so I think really what it is 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 this Gaia, the earth really needs people who are fully embodied, fully present in their, in their spectrum, in their fields, out there anchoring in, supporting the anchoring and sometimes the discharge of her energies right now. And so, you know, some of us are guided to, you know, going out into the ocean and creating giant nets to clean up garbage. Some of us are guided to rescuing animals. Some of us are guided to um, becoming protectors of rainforests and of forests um, and, and really listening, you know, to what's needed in that place and, and following that. So I think there's, you know, there's the embodiment piece. There's, there's a piece about listening, of really being able to silence our minds and receive feedback and being able to take some kind of action with those things together. It's not just like mindless creation um, and disassociation. It's, you know, these are actions that are coming from a place of, of really deep embodiment and love for what is being created. So what are grid workers doing for the earth and what would happen to the earth if people weren't doing this work? So it's, you know, again, grid work can, can rain, it can have a huge, huge, huge range um, from, you know, people that are, are just feeling some, for some reason, I need to create a garden right here on my property. Um, that can be a really simple way to anchor in a love and care of your surroundings 
and of the of plant spirits and of nature spirits. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, we can go all the way to grid workers who are sitting at home and reading a newspaper and blessing every single story they read, mm -hmm. right? They're sending out their blessing to every single person who is in, they're reading through the newspaper. That is a form of grid work. Um, mm -hmm. It can also be sitting in your home in front of your altar and, oh, I'm feeling called for some reason, I'm feeling called to Victoria Falls in, Zam in Zambia. And I need to go there and just be with these falls and, and, and basically astrally project themselves to do that. That's also another form of grid work. Mm -hmm. So I think if, grid, if, if people weren't doing this, if people weren't engaged in this magic, you know, we would still, the earth would still be ascending and would still be tending to her own energetic process and frequencies. But I believe that there is this co-creative process that knits us back into the fabric of, of earth, of the earth. It mm -hmm. knits us back into connection and wholeness again with the, our environment. And I think, you know, this separation has been part of a fracture that has, has had its place. It's had its purpose um, to, again, have the experience of separation on, on this earth plane in this dimension. But I think, you know, part of this is coming back and knitting back ourselves to this state of oneness where there isn't something outside of ourselves. We are all, all of us, you know, myself, you, this plant. Um, we're all one organism experiencing itself in a, in a multifaceted way. Um, how, cause I know there's like, I'm guessing you're doing like upper echelon, top tier elite earth healing grid work, et cetera. So I'm curious to know, like you, given that this is your profession, your path, your purpose, how you're doing it these days and then how like the average Joe with a completely different career path and a family and, you know, a to-do list a mile long, what they can do um, to also contribute without taking it on as their path per se. Sure. Well, to, so I guess to go backwards, um, you know, it's grid work is something and earth stewardship is something that's, really, really, it has like maybe a grandiose title, but it's, this is something that's really easy to practice at any time. Um, so just for example, like having a, a close relationship with, you know, with your plants, like speaking to them, talking to them, even if it's one plant in your house, um, you know, anyone can make five minutes a day to develop a close relationship with one plant. Mm -hmm. um, not anything to say, not create a garden, um, not to go and start homesteading somewhere, even though that's a very popular trend right now, just with one plant, because it starts to kind of give you this remembrance. And I always refer to what I speak about isn't as not, they're not teachings, it's remembrance, because I do think we all came from this sort of understanding of plants and nature, and we've just forgotten those connections. Um, and, and so I think, you know, through this relationship, you'll notice maybe the plant responds to you. Like if you walk in the door, just like your spouse or your pet is greeting you, so does this plant. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that is, is felt, you know, it's, it's a felt experience. Um, and another thing that is really easy to do that I always am encouraging um, people who are attending my workshops to do is practice gridding your home so each um, or your living space. So each di cardinal direction, north, south, east, west, they all have corresponding elements and elemental energies and also even archetypes. Um, and so you can create, even if you put one item, um, for example, like a feather or a wind chime on the eastern part of your house, that's going to help support the air energies which is the corresponding element to the direction of East. Mm -hmm. um, the South, for example, you could have a, a candle, um, just a single candle representing the element of fire. 
um, in the West, maybe have a water feature. You know, they make little tiny ones now you can get like at home goods. Um, or a seashell can be in a windowsill. And then in the north corner, which is the element of earth, you could do, um, you could put a plant, you could even put a beautiful rock or stone that you saw on a walk, um, mm -hmm. signifying that. Just something that's going to remind you of those elements and anchor in those energies around your house. Mm -hmm. And it brings balance to the flow of the entire house because um, we're sort of on the micro scale paying devotional homage to the macro, to um, what's going on around us. And again, it, it just sparks these little connections to um, co-create with, with the nature and with uh, these, you know, we'll call it the mom, as we said, mom, mama Gaia, the sort of mother that's here in this dimensional plane um, presiding over earth. Mm -hmm. And how does your... Olympic level grid work look these days? Well, um, right now, and I, you know, of course I, you know, we all go through seasons and phases. And so when I, I guess my, at, at my Olympic level, it was making these, doing these cross country trips um, and, and physically being in places that I w could practice earth healing there. Um, a few, I guess it was two years ago now, but a girlfriend of mine and I were intuitively guided to the very, she lives in Virginia. And we were just thinking to ourselves that we, we were both looking at a map and we said, we really want, what is in this like very corner, bottom corner of Virginia? What's going on out there? Like, who's there? What's it like there? We were both really drawn to this area and we found out from looking at photos, it's right on the tip of Virginia. So it's got Kentucky up to the north and Tennessee to the west. And so we looked and we found that there's this giant cave that's in this area and also the Cumberland Gap, which historically was the first sort of milestone for people traveling out west that they were about to go into the Midwest. So there's this big gap in the rocks, um, in the stone, in like a stone cliff there. And that's where these settlers would travel through. So we kind of realized there was some um, energetic and historic significance, this place we were drawn to in this cave. So we went there, we spent the night at a campsite outside nearby, and then went up into the cave and we brought all kinds of um, different magical items with us. We created a altar of flowers. We burned um, some fuers, which are um, cigars that we had gotten from Guatemala, from South America, and we had a drum with us, and we just did some intuitive singing and speaking to this cave. And um, we basically what we did was we, I guess, sort of brought like a I I can only describe it as like a rainbow bridge, some kind of release to um, inhabitants that were on a soul level that we're still kind of stuck in the cave. Mm -hmm. And we also lifted a big block that was there that they were sort of anchoring um, across this East West corridor. So we kind of um, broke up that energy and then made it possible for energy to flow in a more easeful intact way from East to West moving out into Tennessee. Um, so that was you know, one of my big sort of projects that I was undertaking in the last few years. Um, and since then, I've been more focused on land stewardship, which um, my husband and I are now on nine acres of land in central New Mexico, right by the Rio Grande. Um, and so I'm now working on projects to um, grid our property. And eventually, the, my goal is to, and what I've sort of been intuitively guided is that this land is going to be able to hold um, many energies from the world. So by taking and bringing small items from my travels, maybe a small jar of water or a, a stone or pebble from somewhere else, bringing that here and anchoring those energies here to, again, create a more robust energetic flow um, throughout the ley lines and grids of this area. Mm -hmm. 
so that's, that's sort of on the big scale that I'm doing as well. That's super cool. What sort of shifts have you seen as a result of this work or people that you work with, have they seen or reported as a result of this work? Yeah, well, the biggest thing is connection. Um, you know, every single every single person that I've experienced, that I've had these experiences with, or that I've like on when I do practice land healings that, um, or give them guidance about how to work with their land, it's all the relationship. They'll say, Oh, it was so exciting. I, I bought these giant stones from my property and I feel like they're speaking to me. Mm -hmm. Um, or, uh, I set up this altar outside and I really, I swear I could, you know, sense the presence of fairies that were supporting the growth of my veggies. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's sort of like this, something clicks where they have a remembrance of, um, this is, this is what we're supposed to do. This is what we're meant to do. Um, and they were, you know, feeling that openness, that open heartedness. So that's the biggest thing, um, that I witness in actual people that I work with and that I, that I advise on these things. And then in terms of their lands, like their properties, a few uh, land healings that I've done, people have reported that they just feel more easeful. Like there's more flow. They're able to make decisions more in a more clear way. Um, and again, they, they feel like they're in starting a relationship with the land. Like they're, they're, they're witnessing in themselves. Okay. I, I am a caretaker here. Um, I, I can, I can have a dialogue with the different parts of the land and it will respond to me. Okay. We do want this fountain to be put here. We do need this water drainage here. Um, please put a bird feeder in this tree. Um, and then, you know, all of a sudden life is flourishing and their, their energy, their personal energetic flow and the energy of the land is in co-creative and supporting each other. Um, so I would say that's, you know, that those, this co-creative quality and um, also this remembrance of these kind of, you know, rituals and devotional ways we used to have comes back online. Um, as you know, I bought some property a few years ago in Ojo Caliente, and I feel like I've learned so much about working with land spirits from working on my own land. And I'd heard that um, that particular, you know, kind of corridor that the Spanish weren't able to conquer it because the spirits were too strong. And what mm -hmm. I've learned on that land is like, mostly ask permission, you know, before cutting down a tree branch, I better ask permission or I'm going to get a giant Russian olive spike through my hand. You know, I've even learned it with the rocks like, oh, this rock is so pretty. And I got and it's weird to say these lessons, right? Because it's coming. It's so intuitive. It's not like a rock is opening its mouth and speaking to me. But I did get this lesson of like, just because you think I'm pretty, like, don't take me from my home and put me in your pocket you greedy asshole it didn't say asshole um but i'm wondering <laughs> are the land spirits or the, the nature spirits in new mexico stronger louder like given that you've worked in so many parts of the world like what's going on here in new mexico which just feels so unique Well, I will say that it's 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 not necessarily you know a, a, like regionally fo like based. There are really strong elemental energies everywhere, um, and it's 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 sort of just where in that place the elemental presence has either been deeply revered over the years, like in Ojo Caliente, um, the hot springs there were historically by the indigenous known by the indigenous people as it to be very, very sacred and were actually only really used for big meetings between other tribes where they could come together in a healing place, in a, in a relaxing place and, and, you know, speak to different matters. And so I think part of what encourages a really strong elemental or nature spirit presence is the, the way that it's been treated over the years in a, is in sacred and sacredness and um devotion over the years so 
specifically in New Mexico, and I found this kind of throughout, um, you know, desert specifically spirits, spirits that are in this sort of desert and grassland areas are very, they are particularly loud. Um, and they're also a little bit, you know, if you think about the animals and the, and the flora and fauna that live here, you know, think about the energy of a cactus, right? It's like, they're kind of prickly, you know, they're a little bit spiny um, and, and very, you know, different than I would explain, for example, like uh, a water spirit that's in a waterfall in Hawaii, you mm -hmm. know, with a lot more softness and fluidity. So um, I think it's really, it's, it can be that some areas here in New Mexico are just intact in their spiritual presence you know, with the nat with this nature spirit presence, and also that there's a particular flavor of nature spirits here that is different and than other, you know, other energies elsewhere. But pretty much everywhere that I've gone, uh, I always at some point stumble upon a strong elemental presence. And that has ranged everything from um, I encountered a troll being underneath a bridge in California, on the coast there, um, in Northern California, to, you know, the really, really bright, bright uh, energies of redwoods, to, um, you know, this very ancient sort of softer quality in the Appalachian area out in North Carolina. And, you know, even when, you know, in traveling in Europe and things like that, there is an it's all there's also many places that have very strong elemental presence just because um there was such a, a a strong knowledge of of elemental energies and so a lot of times shrines or some kind of pyre would be built on a, a zone that was regarded as highly active um and so you know that's been intact over potentially thousands and thousands of years that holds that energy there to that space. Mm -hmm. um, I used to live in this community in Topanga Canyon, which interestingly enough was also a gathering place for all sorts of different tribes to come together and like catch up to speed and trade information. So it's interesting that I have that twice. And mm -hmm. we were all kicked out by, by the powers that were who were being funded by Monsanto as part of their non-native plant eradication project and they couldn't have us living there if they were going to dump 40,000 gallons of Roundup next to the stream. But I know that a lot of environmentalists take issue with non-native plants and how those kind of decimate the environment. What's your view on that working with the spirits of non-natives and how they're integrating with the spirits of native plants or nature in an area. And you're me you're speaking to like in terms of like plant spirits and things like this. Yeah. Like do they have beef with one another? Like do the native plant spirits get pissed off at the non-native plant spirits? Is that some sort of like propaganda that's coming out of the pesticide industry or is is it real? Well, I would say that, you know, an intact eco, all of these places that we travel to are, have like their kind of ideal ecosystem, right? So they have plants, rocks, um, you know, all kinds of trees, all kinds of things that are designed biologically to harmoniously live in that area. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is that, you know, in when it comes to invasive plants, it's kind of more of that inverted idea, right? Of like, I'm not going to listen. I'm just going to put this plant here that I brought in from Japan. Right. Um, you know, I can't really think of any instance where, you know, because you, you'll hear things like, oh, well, we brought in uh, the this type of fish like in, in up in northern New Mexico where, um they've they've brought in a lot of pike to help keep you know which is a aggressive um 
fish that eats other fish, they've brought in the, the pike to help population control other fish, but then it decimates the fish population. So you hear a lot of this like, oh, well, we brought this thing in. It was well-intentioned, um, you know, from another place. But I really can't think of an instance where it has worked out. It's more of this kind of disconnect. Like, I know what I'm doing. I think from, you know, rationally that this is a good idea. And um, there's not really, again, this like listening. So I think, you know, humans can be like without really working on ourselves, we can be very impatient mm -hmm. and sort of just egotistical on how we view things. And I will say, you know, becoming um, aware of nature spirits and aware of earth spirits has really humbled me to you kind of are a dick. Like sometimes you can kind <laughs> of act like a dick and really, really being like, okay, what is the better way? And mm -hmm. having that not be the way that I thought. So for example, when my husband and I moved on to this land last year that we're on, we were basically told by the land, don't do a single thing for a year, mm -hmm. at least, you know, mm -hmm. witness what grows here for better or worse. You know, if it's a, a crazy vine, if it's a parasitic plant, um, if your yard is covered in bindweed, which is like a sort of low growing um, creeper, like morning glory, let it go. Just witness what's happening. And that was frustrating because you get to a new place and you immediately want to make changes and you want to do things. And um, we were basically instructed, just watch and see what happens. Um, and so I think if there was more of this kind of dialogue and, and openness to be wrong, um, we would see more informed decisions taking place. Like, for example, I love the example of, you know, Southern Florida right now is having a huge epidemic of Burmese pythons. Why? Because wealthy people in Miami thought they would be cute little pets. Then they can't handle them when they get to be over 20 feet long and dump them in the Everglades where they have zero natural predators and have just are, are, are overwhelming, you know, the, the native species there. And so it's actually become now that people are going out and hunting these Burmese pythons because they're just doing overkill. And you hear about this too with, um, you know, plant species that are brought in to potentially control a beetle that's, you know, harvesting all or killing all these other trees and it, it backfires in some way. So I think it's, you know, humbling ourselves enough to know that nature does have an intelligent design and um, there's, there is a way that we can correct things that might be slower, might take more time, but ultimately is going to actually restore the ecosystem and not just decimate one corner of it.